Philosopher and author Bernard Henri Levy is here. He started his career as a war reporter for Combat, the underground newspaper founded by Albert Camus. He has written 30 books, including his 1977 work, Barbarism with a Human Face. His new book is called Who Killed Daniel Pearl? I am pleased to welcome Bernard Henri Levy back to this table. Welcome. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Glad uh, to be back, too. Uh, we talked about this book before it was published in the United States uh, in Paris. But tell me again, for, for the benefit of an American audience, again, what was it about that led you uh, to write a book about Daniel Pearl? I would say first the, the very imagery. I was in the, in the office of President Karzai in Kabul. I heard the news, and I saw the image of the decapitation. And this image struck me so much. The idea of a man at the beginning of the 21st century killed because he is a Jew. And this film by a video, all this scene seemed to me so symbolical and so terrible that I had the sentiment that something very important had happened. And I decided to devote the time which would be necessary, it happened to be one year, to try to find what happened, try to find the truth, try to find on what Daniel Pearl was working on, try to find who were the murderers of this terrible crime. This was the first impression. Then I saw the video, uh, I, I first saw some stock shot of the video, then I stopped in Pakistan, I went to Karachi, and I saw the whole video. And do you know where I found it? Where? This terrible and savage video. I, I did not find it, I bought it. And I bought On it... On the street? I bought it at the door of a mosque. At the door of a mosque in Pakistan, which means that this crime, this horrible crime, is presented by his murderers as a sort of act of pride and of propaganda. They are not shame of it. They show it as an act of pride. So all this seemed to me so strange, so symbolical of the time in which we were entering. I had the feeling that we had had, in a few months, the World Trade Center on one side, mm. our entry in the 21st century, and then, symbolically, a sort of micro World Trade Center which was the death of Danny Pearl. But my impression is from the book that your conclusion is that he wasn't killed just because he was a Jew. He wasn't killed uh, for reasons of symbolism, but he was killed because he knew too much. He, it was, in your judgment, a journalistic assassination because a reporter, in your judgment, he was killed. The two stories are true. He was killed. He was kidnapped because he was a Jew and an American in a country where it is a shame and a sin to be a Jew and an American. And then my hypothesis is that we have to take seriously who was Daniel Pearl. He was, first of all, a great reporter, one of your best reporters in this country, brilliant, bright, making very strong stories. So I wanted to go inside that. I followed the track of the murderers, but I followed the track also of Danny Pearl. What was he doing? How did he spend the last days or weeks of his life. I went in the place where he was. I, I met the people he met. I spoke with his fixers, his guides, his uh, translators, and so on. And I rebuilt the, the path on which I think he was. And I concluded, yes, that he was also killed for what he knew, for what he was discovering of this very strange and, and, country, which is Pakistan. And what is that? What do you think his story was? It is, I, I wrote 500 pages about that, of course, so it is difficult to sum it up in a few sentences, but I would say that he, he was on three stories. First story, the links between Al-Qaeda and ISI, the Pakistani right. secret services. Yeah, Al-Qaeda and the intelligence of the country, which, which is supposedly a lie of America and of the West. An ally. First story, yeah. an ally. First story. 
Second story, he was on the track of a strange man, completely unknown of the American and Western press, Mr. Gilani, mm -hmm. who is the chief of a sect, of an organization linked to Al-Qaeda, a sort of master of Osama bin Laden, this Mr. Gilani, a sort of tutor, ins uh, inspirer of uh, um, uh, Osama bin Laden, and whose followers are not only in Pakistan, but also here in the backyard of America, mm. very close to here, in the Catskills, one hour and a, and a half from New York, you have a compound which is called Islamberg, and where you have some followers of this Mr. Gilani, who preach the hatred, the, the fundamentalism, and the murder. They are not murderers. They did not kill. They pretend to be good citizens, and I suppose they are, but they are followers here of Mr. Gilani. And I suppose that the third path on which he was, the third story which he was trying to build, was the one on which he began bef uh, on the 24th of um, December to write for the Wall Street Journal, the nuclear, the atomic story. The question which was just, which was just evoked right. by Mr. Haas, the question of what would happen if the nuclear weapon of Pakistan got out of control and where, if they were traded to Al-Qaeda. What does this make, make of Mr. Musharraf, the president of Pakistan? Yes, he's the president, but is he really a president or is he a puppet president? When I was there, during one of my stays, Mr. Musharraf was waited in Karachi, his economic capital. The travel was cancelled and at the last minute because his own security could not guarantee, guarantee his security in Karachi. He is a sort of king without kingdom, master without territory. He is in the fortress of Islamabad. The country is out of control. You, it, you, cannot, you cannot rely or, on Mr. Musharraf in order to, to, to think that Pakistan can be controlled and mastered. But he is the, the principal ally of the United States. That is a point. Maybe the America and also the Europe, Europe have to re-examine and to reconsider their alliance. Maybe we are coming in a new century and our ways of thinking must be reshaped. And then what are our options? Options is to, is to is to tie the alliance and the aid to some conditions. Mr. Bouchard was received in Washington and also in Paris. We are not, we did not do better than you. Yes. He was received with all the honors, with a red carpet, and he is fueled, we have channeled to him billions and billions of dollars without any conditions. Is this really diplomacy? And the condition should really? be that he clean up his own secret service, intelligence There service. are a lot of conditions. Okay. For example, of course, to clean really his secret service, to, to, to make some, some steps towards the democracy, also some very symbolical conditions. Why Mr. Bush and Mr. Chirac did not ask Musharraf this very simple thing to build? in the center of Karachi, a memorial, a place of sorrow and of mourning for Daniel Pearl, this American hero killed there with the complicity of the ISI. This was a very simple and symbolical condition. Even this was not asked to Musharraf. I think that this is, this is not good politics. It was not asked of him. It was not asked The United to, States or not, the French did not ask him to do this. Did not ask that. that to Musharraf. And I think that our duty is to help to maintain some alliance, but according to certain conditions, political, symbolical. What's the response of the Daniel Pearl family to this book? Do they accept your thesis? There is not one thesis in this book. There are a few theses. I, I think that uh, you should ask them. They agree with some. They disagree with others. We spoke about it. I speak of that inside the book. 
We, we spoke of that. There are some of the hypotheses of the book with, with which they disagree. For which, instance, I think, for instance, but I don't want to speak in his behalf, but I think that Jude Appel, the father of Danny, does not think so much as I do that he was killed because he knew too much. He thinks he was killed simply because he was a Jew and, and he was a symbolic target. Something like that. Maybe he's right. Maybe I am partly right too. He knows. I know. I did this, um, this long investigation. My problem is not to know who is right. I, I, again, I devoted this year of my life, all this time, to try to make a few steps in the search of the truth. This is what interests me, the truth, to find it. And we are, many of us, to search, and I hope to find it. Okay. There is in this book, reporting, reportage, you also use a novelist technique. You imagine, imagine. Not so much. What, with what Daniel Pearl might have been thinking. Yeah. Might have been thinking mm -hmm. as he faced his own execution. Mm -hmm. Why? 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 What's the point of doing it? And how do you know? And isn't it simply speculation on the part this, of a writer? First of all, with no I, I don't. No, no, wait a minute. First of all, I don't confuse the two levels. Yeah. Contrary to certain very big American writers, I draw the line between investigation and speculation. Right. Most of the book, 95% of the book, is investigation. Reporting and investigation. Reporting and investigation. And there are a few pages, two scenes, the death of Daniel Pearl, the last minutes, and the thoughts, the intimate uh, thoughts of Omar Sheik, his murderer, just before the kidnapping, which are speculation. Mm. But the two are very precisely separated. There is not one moment in the book where the reader can ask himself, am I in speculation okay, but, or am I in investigation? Okay, but, but let's just ask me why you thought it was important to include that. I mean, what was the purpose? Even though you make the distinction so I, I between you speculation clearly. Okay. and... Okay, because, because of the video because of the video. The, the video of the decapitation. The video of the decapitation. Because there is today in circulation, and it is in circulation, one, one point of view on this murder, which is the point of view of the murderers. And this video, I told you before, it circulates, it is sold. You find it at the door of certain mosques in Pakistan and maybe elsewhere. So. I, my idea was to offer and to, to build another point of view, another version of the, of the thing, of the event. Moreover, to compete with the idea of those people who would sell such an not, awful tape? Not, not to leave them the last word. Not to leave the killers the last word. This video is, is unbearable. I think it is the first time in the history of um, of murder that this happened. Generally, the other fascists uh, hide their crimes. It is a, a terrifying secret, as the Nazis do. It is the first time that it is no longer hidden, no longer a secret, but exhibited as a show and given to the, to the, to the great spectacle. You say that you are, as we pull away from the Daniel Pearl story and the story of Pakistan, um, as a philosopher, one of the new philosophers in Paris at the time, of, uh, early in your life, uh, that you are an anti-anti-American. What does that mean? It means that... You're uh, against people who are anti-American? It means first that there is in France a strong current of anti-Americanism. Where do you think it comes from? It comes from a long tradition and contrary to to what generally Americans think, it does not come from extreme left, but it comes from extreme right. If you do the history in France, I, I, am, I know the history of the ideas of my country, if you do the history of this topic, anti-Americanism, the genealogy of it is in the fascist groups of the 30s and of the 20s more than um, in, the, in the leftist group of that. And why? 
because I think that um, the idea of America, because it is not the it is not the real America which is concerned, it is a, an idea, a fantasy of America. America embodies all that the French fascist tradition hates: cosmopolitanism, a country where you have a lot of Jews and a lot of black, a, con a recent country. A sort of country which is very, which looks like the Jean-Jacques Rousseau well, contra social. Uh, and, and a policy of immigration, which Con they're right the, is so the, opposed to in France. Yes, and the social contract of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Right. Remember, Jean-Jacques Rousseau said the good nationhood, the, a good nation is a nation whose members come, sit and say, okay, we are a lot of people, we decide to build a nation. The extreme right in France hates that. She believes the extreme right in nation rooted in the ground, rooted in the common blood, rooted in the common uh, color mm. of a face. But, but, but what and about... And you, you have one country, America, it's, it's like this. You have two, Israel and America, who say we are a social contract. People coming from everywhere gather and say we make a nation. This is horrible for the European fascists. This is the root of anti-Americanism. So, Do you think so? More than some sense of America's uh, a, a resistance, what they see as America's omnipotence, a resistance to America's cultural hegemony, a resistance to all of that? Don't think so. Doesn't, that, none of that matters? Or is there is also that. But, but if you go to the depth, if you go to the roots, it is closer to what I say uh, than, than to, to this. And moreover, I would say something else. Why do I hate anti-Americanism in spite of disagreeing very often with America? Especially on not, Iraq. And not only on Iraq. There are a lot of things in this country, like in every country, which seems to me not, not so good. But the anti-Americanism do not hate America for what she does badly, for, do not hate America for its Mistakes, bad side. Right but sometimes, very often, for its good sides. This is true, for example, in, pa in the Muslim world, in Pakistan. They do not hate America for, for its bad sides, imperialism and so on, but for its good side, freedom of speech, women going with bare face. Women have an opportunity. And so on, yes. So this is also a, 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 a characteristic of this anti-Americanism. It attacks you on the better of your way of life. But do you believe that your president and your foreign minister uh, are reflective anti-Americanism? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I think that um, Dominique de Villepin, he made a mistake at the end of the process with the veto story. But I think that he was right to try to convince his American friends our historical ally, not to go to this war. I told it to you at this very table, not the same one we were in Paris. Right. The war in Iraq is morally right and is, and is politically wrong. This was a story, morally right. It is always right to, to, to put down a dictator, a butcher, as was Saddam Hussein, but politically wrong we begin to understand it today. And this was the position, more or less, of, of Villepin. It was not a bad position. There was a sort of uh, antagonization between France and America, which was very um, uh, overdone, overdone. Do you think that the, it will come back together, these two countries? That there I, will be a I hope so. bridging of the... I, I hope so. I hope so. There and what's is, necessary to do that? There is a book, which you know, written by Mr. Kagan and Mr. Crystal, I think. Right, our right. road begins in Baghdad. I would say our French, I would love, I would dream that our friendship begins again in Baghdad. The friendship... To between, reconstruct to Iraq. Re, to reconstruct Iraq, of course, because now the situation, it is too late to know who was right and who was not right. Now the situation is what it is. You have American boys who die every day. You have a destroyed country with some raped women, with some poor people, with a, a, a destroyed area. We have to rebuild that. 
And I think that America deserves relief and that France and Europe has the duty to cooperate to this work, whatever are the quarrels of the past, whatever who was right and who, were, who was wrong. Moreover, we have in France, we show it, we, sh we have shown it in, um, in Kosovo, for instance, with Bernard Kushner, yeah, my yeah. friend Kushner. My friend Kushner. In Bosnia, we had a certain knowledge in nation building. I am not sure that America has a very good knowledge in this. He, she had previously, but I think America lost the knowledge in nation building. Maybe you cannot be at the same time the cop and the nurse. So we might have to share the task, the cop and the nurse. Maybe we can, Europe can help in nursing this poor country. I heard yesterday in here in your studio, a very informed and brilliant woman, responsible, Mrs. Jessica Matthews, saying that we had to quit. But what is that? What irresponsibility. We could quit this destroyed country. We could leave these people to this civil disorder. It will be a complete failure. It will be a moral disaster. We have the duty to stay now and to rebuild Iraq. We have the duty of that. We cannot go. And I think that we cannot. The international community today has to share the, the the, the work. America will have in this case also to make a step. You cannot, uh, you cannot uh, have the cake and eat it too. We have, you have to share. Right. You have to share. <laughs> Maybe we have to invent a system where there will be some areas, areas on American control and some other areas on na uh, United Nations control. The diplomats will imagine that. All right. But it is the emergency. This Today. book is called Who Killed Daniel Pearl? Bernard Henri Levy. Uh, congratulations. Good to see you. Thank friend. you, Charlie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.